For years, Adobe has been trying to break into the 3D market, aiming to make 3D more accessible to designers. We've seen various attempts across Photoshop, Illustrator, and After Effects, but so far everything they've tried has fallen short. Simply put, Adobe doesn't understand 3D. However, because the 3D market is so crucial, Adobe made a bold move a few years back and acquired Alidorhythmic, a company that's a staple in the 3D industry. The years following the acquisition were rough, with Photoshop even losing its 3D functionality entirely. But now, it seems we're back on track. In the latest beta, Photoshop has regained its 3D capabilities, and I'm happy to say they're better than ever. There's still room for improvement, but from what I've seen so far, I'm optimistic about what the future holds. Let's have a closer look. In order for Photoshop to read 3D files, we need one more application, the Substance 3D Viewer. It's definitely not the cleanest way of doing things from a UX point of view, but I think in the long term it's for the best because now developers can add as many features as they want without having to worry about uh, compatibility or any other potential issues inside Photoshop. Here I have this uh, simple banner for this imaginary fashion magazine. I left the center part empty because I want to have a pack shot of the magazine there. It would have been amazing if we could just drop in the Cinema 4D file, but unfortunately Photoshop cannot read that, so we have to convert it to another format. I used FBX because it's the most uh, flexible format compared to OBJ. So let's drag it inside Photoshop and see what we get. The file is imported as a smart object, and if we double click it, we'll be able to adjust it. But first, let's move it into the banner. Alright, now let's double click, and after a couple of seconds, Substance Viewer opens up. This is where we'll make all the adjustments to our 3D object. Notice that all the other elements in our banner came through too, which really helps with positioning the magazine. I want the magazine to overlap a little bit with the typography at the bottom, so I'll reframe it and rotate the camera accordingly. Right now, the render is not looking great because we're using a fast preview method. But before switching to the final red trace result, let's make a couple more tweaks. First, we'll add some contact shadows. In the environment tab, we need to enable the ground plane, which will add shadowing underneath the magazine. It's not easy to see here because the lighting is not facing the right direction, but we can rotate the HDR around and now we have some better shadows. We can also use other HDRIs for different looks. For example, the second HDR image gives us harder shadows because it's using the sun as the main light source. We can even use a custom HDR image, which is definitely nice to have. For now though, let's stick with the first HDRI and enable ray tracing. This will give us a higher quality render with nicer shadows. It'll take longer to render, but for something like this, it's nothing too crazy. And now that the render is complete, we're ready to send it back to Photoshop. Alright, now let's go through another common scenario. The creative director loves our banner design, but wants to use a different spread on the magazine. Thankfully, we can do that easily inside Substance Viewer. We don't have to go back to Cinema and re-export the scene. So let's double click the layer, let's disable ray tracing so we can work a little bit faster. And now if we head over to the materials section, notice the different options that pop up. These are basically the materials I've created inside Cinema. 6 materials in Cinema 4D, and 6 materials in Substance Viewer. All we need to do now is go to the left page, pick another texture, and just like that our left page is updated. There are also options for tweaking things like glossiness or roughness, but for now we're good. Let's do the same for the right page. Excellent. Now let's enable ray tracing and wait for the final render. What's worth noting here is that the render is in its own layer, so we can easily adjust all the other elements without having to re-render. We can change the background color, we can change the typography, and most importantly, we can adjust the 3D element in a more interactive way. 
That's the beauty of a system like this one. We have complete control of every single element. And the good thing about it is that the Photoshop file is not bogged down by the 3D elements because it's just treated as a single image, a smart layer to be more specific. I can easily see an ad agency making great use of this. The 3D artist can prepare a file that the graphic designer can easily adjust in their work without having to go back and forth for minor render changes. And because the application is simple enough, there's not a lot of 3D knowledge needed. As long as the file is nicely prepared, all the designer has to do is make some basic adjustments and they're good to go. Substance Viewer's Achilles heel is the clunky UI. If you don't know certain features exist, they're easy to miss. But if you know where to look, they're easy to adjust. For example, when I first started playing around with the app, I completely missed the material editing options. And that's because Substance Viewer is very picky with where you click. If I click on the magazine, none of the materials show up. For whatever reason, I have to click outside the magazine area to get the material options to show up. It's clunky and it's weird and hopefully it will improve in the future. Despite these issues though, I'm really happy with what we have so far. There's still a ton of features missing, but we'll discuss these in a bit. For now, let's go through another cool feature. And for that, we'll use this file here. This is the kind of scene you would use to present your designs to a client. Showing just the 2D Illustrator file usually doesn't cut it. They want to be wowed, that's why mockups like uh, this one are the way to go. So let's tweak the composition a little bit to make it look nicer. Like before, we can adjust all material parameters. We can change the color of the lid, we can adjust the roughness, we can even add a reflective ground, but I don't care about any of those things. What I'm interested in is this tab here. This is the AI image generation tab. I know currently every single company out there is pushing AI at us, but this is actually a really solid use case. Here, we can take our 3D render and use it as the base for an AI generated image. This is perfect because we can basically go through ideas and concepts really fast without committing an insane amount of time building every single one of them from scratch. Think of it as a very quick and dirty mood board. Let me show you what I mean. We have several options to choose from. We can use our 3D render without much alteration. We can generate a completely new image where we can define how much of our model will be altered. And finally, we can completely change the look of our renders. Since we don't want to alter the design, we're gonna go with the first option. Now, let's see what could work with this composition. One approach would be to have the coffee cups on a bench. So we can just type out the prompt, and a few seconds later, we have four ideas to choose from. Are they perfect? <laughs> no, not really, but we can quickly gauge if this is a good direction for a concept. That's all this is, a brainstorming tool and nothing more. Let's now try something else. Let's have the coffee cups on a blue background with some coffee beans thrown around. Like before, the actual look and feel is not perfect, but it's good enough to get an idea across. So when we have a meeting with the rest of the creative team, we can go through these uh, quick sketches and decide on a specific direction. Then we can actually produce the better looking image, whether that is a full on 3D render or a photo shoot or a combination of both. But even if you're not a fan of these AI assisted images, all the other features in the Substance Viewer application are really handy. I feel Adobe finally has a solid grasp on 3D. Photoshop's 3D implementation is finally good enough. It's not perfect, but it's a step in the right direction. At this point, I think it's worth highlighting some of the issues in the Substance Viewer app, just to give the dev team some useful feedback. Knowing Adobe though, they will probably completely ignore it and do their own thing, but at least I did my part. So let's go through some of the bigger issues. An FBX file holds way more data than just objects and materials, but Substance Viewer completely ignores most of it. It can read animation data, but cameras and lights are completely ignored. I would really love to see both of these things exposed on the interface. Having an HDRI to light your scene is not enough. We need some more customization abilities. 
I know that Adobe is uh, very hesitant exposing parameters and uh, overwhelming the user, but if the user is smart enough to understand absorption distance and uh, scattering distance, they're smart enough to enable or disable a light and adjust its intensity. Whoa. And of course, it would be insanely powerful if we could have access to the object's hierarchy. It doesn't have to be every single object, but at least allow access to the parent object so we can easily turn it on or off if needed. Otherwise, we have to create multiple variations of the same 3D file just so we have a slightly different version of it. That's an insanely inefficient way of working. Which brings us to another big limitation. We currently have the option to rotate, scale, and position our scene, but this is only useful when you have one single object in the scene. First off, make these fields work like sliders. Inputting values by hand is just pure insanity. Okay, <laughs> back to my point. What if we want to move or rotate one of the objects in the scene? Currently, we cannot do that. So Adobe's solution to this issue is going back to the 3D application, making that change, exporting a new FBX file, and importing that back into Photoshop. That's way too many steps for something so simple. If this tool is going to be used by agencies, it needs to be more flexible. Otherwise, there's going to be endless back and forth between the 3D artist and the designer. Another gripe I have with the application is uh, Adobe's typical hesitation to expose users to too many 3D options and terminology. Right now, there's no way to adjust the render settings, and the camera options default to field of view instead of the more familiar focal length. It's odd that they use a field of view, especially since focal length is a well-known photography term. And we're talking about Photoshop here. So I think this is a really poor choice on their part. There are a ton of other small issues like uh, color inconsistencies, difficulties in uh, managing multiple 3D files at once, undo problems, and issues with uh, exporting the AI-generated 3D objects. But if I go through all of these one by one, the video is going to end up even longer than it currently is. So I'll just touch on one last thing, the aspect ratio of the AI-generated images. Right now, they're locked to a square format, which is an aspect ratio designers rarely use. Firefly allows for switching between different aspect ratios, so I would expect that same functionality here. Despite these issues though, I think Photoshop's new 3D capabilities are definitely a step in the right direction. I think this update will likely boost the template market for 3D files inside Photoshop. It definitely unlocks a lot of possibilities. I'm even considering uh, preparing some uh, 3D files uh, specifically for use inside Photoshop because I believe templates like these can be incredibly helpful for designers. I'll let you know if and when I have something ready. And that pretty much wraps things up for this video. I would suggest downloading the new version of Photoshop and Substance Viewer and giving the feature a try. I think you will absolutely love it. Take care, and I'll see you in the next one.